Hi everybody, uh, welcome to this Museums Association and Culture and webinar, Museums and Black Lives Still Matter. My name is Rebecca Atkinson, I'm the Events Programmer at the MA and I'll be facilitating today largely from the background. For the benefit of any blind and partially sighted attendees, I'm a white 40 year old cis woman with brown hair and my pronouns are she and her. Before I hand over to our chair, Errol Francis, who's the Chief Executive of Culture and, I have a few really quick housekeeping announcements to make. First and foremost, this is an opportunity for you to take part in the discussion as well. So please do use the chat function to introduce yourself and respond to the issues raised. I think more than 400 people have signed up to this event, which is amazing. Um, so even though we can't all see each other, um, it's still hopefully a really great networking opportunity. If you have a question that you'd like Errol to put to our panelists today, then please pop this in the Q&A. Um, and you can tweet as well, of course, using the hashtag museums Black Lives Matter. I won't be looking the webinar, so if you leave or your internet drops out, you can just rejoin again and using the same link in your journal instructions. Um, we are recording the event today and it will be available afterwards on our website and on Culture Anne's website. Um, the chat is also available on request. Finally, we're going to be running a short survey after the event um, and we're keen for as many delegates as possible to fill this in. I will show a chat, uh, sorry, a link in chat at the end of today's event and I'll also be sending this around via email, so do look out for that. And um, that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Errol now to get started. If you want to turn your camera on, Errol. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and a very good evening and a warm welcome to everybody. My name is Errol Francis. I'm the CEO and Artistic Director of Culture and a London-based arts organisation that works to open up the UK arts and heritage sectors to a more diverse workforce and audience. It's been a great pleasure to have convened this event in collaboration with the Museums Association. And I thank the director, Sharon Heal and her team for their generous support. And you'll hear from Sharon shortly. We've decided to hold this event because it's now one year since the appalling murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. As you'll recall, the atrocity sparked a global protest about the way black people and other racialized communities are treated by criminal justice systems in countries who variously style themselves as leaders of the free world or claim to have a sense of fair play. Fueled by the iniquitous impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, what started as an uprising over the criminal justice system in one country, the USA, quickly developed into an international protest, not only about racist criminal justice and penal systems, but the whole structure of neoliberal societies in which white supremacy is embedded into institutional and governmental structures at every level. Having previously mostly avoided inclusion in oppressive institutional power structures, Museums had been mostly exempt from this critique, yet the protests very quickly turned to heritage. What do we mean by heritage? Who and what do we choose to remember? And to whom does heritage speak? Crucially, the question of what is the connection between museums and racialized violence became critical. Um, above all, issues which had been simmering for some time about contested heritage not only the continued celebration of an imperial past in which enslaved people of color had their cultural assets looted and hoarded in Western museums, Black Lives Matter also sharpened questions around how should we and who should tell the story about colonialism and imperialism through the objects in our national collections. In the UK, this all came to a head in the city of Bristol, where the statue of the city's first mayor, Edward Colston, a member of parliament and a member of the Royal African Company was torn down and thrown into the river Avon, the, the Bristol Harbor, the same port that received over 500,000 enslaved African people traded by British merchants. However, I should note that one of the inspirations for this uh, event this evening was how last year, UK arts and heritage institutions seemed to compete with each other to post statements saying how they stood in solidarity with the British black community. Yet these statements of apparent solidarity um, were notably lacking in agendas for action or change in addressing equality, diversity and inclusion in museums. In many cases, the statements only served to draw attention to the museum's own complicity with colonial violence in the seizure and continued hoarding of cultural assets, such as the Benin bronzes, and the need for their restitution 
of this um, cultural property, as well as the imperative to address inclusion and diversity in their workforce and audience. So it was to address the yawning gap between these statements and the institutional records of their authors on diversity and inclusion that Culture and published the Black Lives Matter Charter for the museum sector. Now, one of the issues that we're gonna be exploring this evening with our wonderful panel of guests from the UK and the USA is the contrasting ways in which Black Lives Matter was addressed in, in both countries, in heritage institutions. Um, in Minneapolis, for example, the epicenter of the protest, the Walker Art Center announced that it would no longer cooperate with the police in the city until the, it had implemented long lasting and meaningful changes. In March this year, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland announced it's to return a Benin bronze after a review concluded that the object had been acquired in, quote, an extremely immoral manner. So this evening, we have a distinguished panel of speakers from the UK and USA who will share their perspectives on what the Black Lives Matter has achieved in heritage institutions and what remains to be done. So the purpose is to keep alive and to re-energize the debate around heritage and to restate this agenda for change. Especially we want to hold to account those who said they, said they stood in solidarity with the black community and to form a transatlantic, a transatlantic coalition that builds on the Black Lives Matter movement and sustains its agenda into the future. So the structure of this evening is that I'll introduce the panel after Sharon has made some comments and then there'll be a series of questions um, uh, opening to the panel before opening up with a Q&A with the audience. So before I introduce the uh, panel, I'd like to hand over to Sharon Hill, Director of the Museums Association, who will make a statement on behalf of her organisation. Thank you so much, Errol, and thank you to the panellists who've agreed to speak today and to all of you who've committed by coming to this event. It's been a real honour and a pleasure to work with Culture and on this event. In terms of how museums are tackling racism, what we found is that it's easy to say what sounds like the right thing, but harder to do the right thing. There have been some good examples of museums that have turned their words from last summer into action and that are, are proactively making changes. But where those changes really make a difference is when museums have worked alongside and listened to their communities. There's great examples of work at National Museums Liverpool, at National Museum Wales, at the Imperial War Museum, at Somerset House and a host of local museums. But it's our job to not only provide a platform for that best practice, but also to ensure a continuing conversation. At the MA, we're committed to this work. We've discussed and agreed an anti-racism action plan at board level. We're working in partnership with Culture and on this event and on future events. We'll take this conversation into our annual conference in November. We're working with our individual and institutional members to provide a platform for best practice and to keep the pressure on museums to deliver. And also, I think very importantly, we're supporting the work of the Decolonisation Guidance Working Group, which met just yesterday to discuss the guidance that it's producing and its plan to publish that guidance by the time of our conference in November. Decolonisation work in museums, I think, is critical to this conversation. Britain had one of the largest empires the world has ever seen, and it has left a legacy of inequality and racism in society that is captured in many museums and their collections. And we, as a museums association, as the holders of the code of ethics for museums, have an ethical duty and responsibility to support our members to explain that complex past and to understand its ramifications in society today. So we're pledged to keep working towards a place where museums are inclusive by default, not exception, where museums see it as their natural role to explore their own difficult histories and work towards equality and social justice with their communities. So I'm going to stop there because I'm very keen to hear from all the other panellists. We've got an exceptional panel today. So I'm going to hand back to Errol and thank you again for your championing of this work in the sector. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, so now um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel um, and um, starting with Arika Oke, um, who, is, uh, who is the Managing Director at Black Cultural Archives, the National Heritage Centre dedicated to collecting, preserving and celebrating the histories of African and Caribbean people in Britain. She was previously collections development archivist at the Welcome Collection and archivist for the Rombert, Britain's National Company for Contemporary Dance. Arike sits on the board for the National Archive, uh, UK's Unlocking Archives project, and is also a member of BAFTA Heritage Board. Um, also, Hassan Mahamdali is a specialist in diversity and equality in the arts and former director of the Muslim Institute. He's an internationally known senior policymaker, workshop leader and trainer. And Hassan is also the author of Arts Council England's unique approach, the creative case for diversity. With a background in theater, Hassan is also a published writer, playwright, campaigner for race equality, and an expert in Muslim culture and thought. Ian Dermont Martin is a writer and director by passion and a creative executive by trade. Ian is the artistic director of Haven Chicago and the executive director of inclusion and belonging at the Art Institute of Chicago. Ian has worked with a number of arts and cultural institutions, including Enrich uh, Chicago, a collaborative of arts, culture and funding institutions collectively engaging in the work of, ant of anti-racist and racial equity organizing. Rachel Minot is trustee of the Museums Association where she is the chair of the Decolonizing Guidance Working Group. She, panel she champions collaborative practices and challenges the concept of neutrality in public spaces. Previous curatorial projects have included collaborations with the Horniman Museum and Gardens, Birmingham Museums Trust, London Transport Museum, Reading Museum, and the Robert Sainsbury Library. And Monica O. Montgomery is curator of special projects and programming at the Smithsonian Institution Arts and Industries Building. As an arts administrator and independent curator, she works at the intersection of equity, community and diversity in museums. Monica has curated many social justice themes, exhibits, experiences and festivals with renowned organizations, including Brooklyn Museum. Monica is also the co-founder and strategic director of Museum Hue, which works to advance the visibility and viability of black, indigenous and other people of color in museums in the United States. Now, we were to be joined by Henri Latil Watkins, um, but I'm sorry to say that due to uh, um, a misunderstanding about time zones, she's unable to, uh, to join us. So I'm really sorry about that. And we were looking forward to having her involvement, but welcome panel. It's a real delight to have you all um, participate in this conversation. And um, I have a series of questions for you, as you know, and I wanted to start with a obvious and simple in a way question uh, that arises from Black Lives Matter. What has the use of violence such as was perpetrated upon George Floyd, what has this got to do with museums? Would you like to kick off Hassan with that? Uh, uh, hello everybody, um, thanks so much for the organisers for inviting me to put my two pennies worth in. Uh, I don't come from the museum sector, uh, uh, actually, as a, I was just thinking back, actually, as a child, a working class child in uh, South London in the 1960s and 70s, I don't think I ever went to museums. Uh, it's, it's not really in my family's uh, culture, as it were, to go to museums, which is quite interesting. But um, but I do take a, um, uh, especially at the moment, I'm, I'm fascinated, actually, by the debates, with the kind of chain of events, I guess, that started with the murder of, uh, of uh, George Floyd and uh, why we're here today, I suppose, uh, and how we what's the kind of uh, series of events that got us to this place, and where we might go next. Uh, as a uh, as a reporter, Errol, I reported a lot of black deaths in custody here in the UK in the nineteen eighties and nineties, and 
And in the black communities in the UK, uh, the, the issue of police violence specifically uh, has been a, uh, uh, an ongoing traumatic uh, um, scar on people's lives, I think. I, I, I saw firsthand families of young black men who'd been murdered uh, by the police uh, and the police getting away with those murders uh, because they knew the police knew they had the state on their on their side and their fights for justice which were which were inspirational but painful to see uh, but uh, uh, I, I guess in in essence Errol I suppose we're talking about the question of how violence is embedded in our societies and trying to pull away the veil um, uh, of the kind of obf obfuscation and the kind of uh, uh, the dodging of the issues or the, the, the polite, civilized English upper class kind of uh, uh, way of, of arguing things until the, the real meat of the matter kind of disappears, which I think <laughs> I'm watching at the moment as it comes to the museum sector and the kind of people who are engaged in the debates at the moment. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a nature of, of everyday, uh, everyday intense, horrific violence, which is actually embedded in uh, in 21st century capitalism, but which it but which manifests itself in different ways uh, relating to power and questions of race. So that'd be my kickoff, I think. Thank you, Hassan. Now let's cross the Atlantic and see, Monica. Would you like to respond to that? What I has this love this to. <laughs> this violence, what has it got to do, to do with museums, which is regarded as rather peaceful, civilized spaces? What, what, what's the Where connection? are they? So I think um, we have to redefine the way we look at museums and the purpose of them. I believe that a museum is supposed to be in service to society. So if a museum is a mirror of our humanity, past, present, and even future, and the environment, if museums can tackle these tough topics like war and genocide and enslavement, and all of the other ills and isms that have been a byproduct of the human struggle, then why not discuss, discover, curate, and approach what's happening right now in a way that is sensitive, culturally informed, and understanding of the traumas that everyday people are facing. And so if we realize that our museums are telling stories, it can't just be about the safe areas of the past that have been deemed history. History is happening right now in our country, excuse me, in my country that I don't really want to claim, but I have to. January 6th was another um, area of terrible, you know, just riotous, chaotic contention, you know, battling between people of different ideologies. That needs to be expressed. But when we think of Black lives and this continuous injustice of the killing and the maiming and the violence and the way the spectacle of that is articulated in the media, the way that filters through to public conversations and private conversations, then museums need to do that work. And there's many ways that they can, and there's many museums that have started, whether it be artful interventions or looking at timelines of histories of injustice, but I think ultimately we can't dance around it and we can't avoid it because our audiences need the space to contextualize and to grieve and to grow. And so we as museum stewards are bound to do that work and those that are not doing it are not doing justice to the audiences that they say they want to reach. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with this um, a bit. I'm going to dig a bit way at, at this because I think this is something that some people in you know following the the the, move, the black lives matter movement don't really get this because the museums are not really educating us in this story so i'm going to put the question again and i'm going to ask Enrique as the head of a archive that really records black history museums and violence what is the connection for you um, I think that's a really interesting way to phrase it, actually. I was going to answer slightly differently until you said museums and violence, what's the connection? When <laughs> so many um, British museums are, are full of records of violence, you know, British history and the history of empire is, is, is a violent history. Um, and there seems, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable for some people perhaps to see it as a violent history, but it is inescapably a violent history, whether or not it's acknowledged, you know, our museums are, are full of spoils of war and spoils of colonizing 
other countries around the world. And yes, that's made Britain what it is today. It's made the British language, like the English language, so rich and full of words from other countries. And it's made our museums so rich and full of treasures from other countries too, as well as treasures that were made in these islands, these specific islands, which are now Britain and not the enormous spread of islands around the world, which used to be uh, thought of as Britain as well as part of the British Empire. But that wasn't how I was going to answer you because <laughs> it's just that you sort of set me off on one when you said museums and violence. I'm like, okay, well, they actually do go together. They go together as much as museums and education do. They go together as much as museums and remembrance do. Museums and violence, I don't think, can be separated. And I don't think that's, I actually honestly don't think that's problematic. That's part of our story, actually. Um, but the way I was going to answer it was just to sort of think about what BCA is and how BCA came about. So BCA Black Cultural Archives is about 40 years this year, depending on when you date the firming up of an idea into an institution. Um, and BCA, to cut a long story short, is essentially looking at history from the Black perspective which is meaning that black history and British black history is not an other, it's not a diversity project. It's not looking at white history or uh, even you know, multicultural history and going, well, the black story is part of that. It's looking at the black story and then the rest of history is seen through that lens, which is a really, really interesting concept and one that we could have more and more and more of across all the different ways all the different spectrum of ways that we could look at and interrogate our history and how we got here and how identity is built and how communities are created and how communities are linked together and what keeps us apart and why we have ridiculous conversations with, with apologies to people who think they're not ridiculous but ridiculous conversations about contested history and whether statues should come down. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Now, um, Ian, let's flip back to the, the USA. Um, you, you work for um, a very august institution, the Art Institute of Chicago. Any thoughts on this question, the relationship between a heritage or a, a museum collection and, and the history of violence? In, um... Yeah, thank you, Errol. I love, love this question. I think it's intentionally <laughs> loaded and I appreciate it and layered. Um, I think to the untrained eye, there is an inherent connection. You know, I think uh, what, what, is, what does education have to do with violence? You know, to Enrique's point about museums and the relationship to education being really habitual, really inherent. Situ similarly to the untrained eye, there is no relationship between education and violence. But for young Black people in education systems, we can very easily get into conversations about the you know, school to prison pipeline or the inherent violence that young Black girls experience in education systems naturally. And so, I think uh, for me, the connection comes down to narrative. What stories are told about Black people in our countries? What stories are upheld about Black people in our countries, historically and presently? And how are museums contributing to upholding specific narratives? How have museums contributed to upholding specific narratives? And or how are we transforming them? Traditionally, museums have been, for me, repositories of white supremacy, which is inherently violent. You know, and I, I do work at the Art Institute of Chicago. And when, you know, ground was broken on that building, the names of artists were carved into the facade. And most of those artists were white European men. And while, you know, in the, in the decades and decades since there's been a lot of change institutionally, 
and and also just you know politically uh those words are still in the building those names are still in the building and uh so when i think about the connection i think about the narratives that we're perpetuating or upholding versus actually shifting to transform them and and how do we as museums and as a museum sector move from being that repository of of violence or supremacy and start to actively shift narratives and give context to, to new narratives. So that's how I think about that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Rachel, would you have any reflections on, on that? I do. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm on my, I had to join in on my phone because internet issues with the digital world. But um, I also think this is a really powerful question. Um, and as a lot of the other panelists have alluded to, I think there is a there is a privilege in having not ever thought about a museum space as a violent space, as being able to visit museums and to find them safe and um, reflective of you, yourself, your story, your truth. I don't think that's an experience that a lot of people have. Um, but there is a dichotomy that exists between the people who think of these spaces as theirs, their safe space, the narrative that they want to protect, and those who've always felt the violence and the erasure. The stories and, and, and the sadness and, uh, that of George Floyd's death is that it wasn't unique in its violence. It was unique in the response to the violence. But this sorts of violence happens regularly. And it has happened regularly for hundreds of years. And within museums, we hold those stories of this violence, of these hundreds of years of violence, of, of, of individuals who are named, who are not named, whose bodies remain held within museum spaces. And the biggest violence that museums perpetuate is this silence violent, where we don't tell those stories. The impact of George Floyd's death and murder was that so many people could see it, they knew the story, they could understand the injustice, um, they could understand that this was something criminal happening and we were witnessing it. People could witness this violence and that all the all the violences and all the stories in our museum spaces, we have that evidence. But for some reason, and this reason is probably white supremacy and racism as we've all talked about, those stories are hidden but held. So. I think that's why my, my feelings around museums and violence is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All of your um, very moving comments about this. I have to say, and for the benefit of yourselves and the audience, the, the way that this question came to me last summer, and I had to ask, I, the way I answered it was actually by going to look at objects in museums. Um, and um, it was the Benin bronzes and reading about how they were taken and the spectacular violence that was used that brought me to this um, question. But I should also mention that what you, you mentioned, Rachel, about the erasure um, is, uh, um, reminds me of another type of violence that has been termed by the great post-colonial writer, um, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. And she came up with this term, epistemic violence. And what she's talking about is the violence of uh, uh, othering in discourse, the silence that Monica has just reminded us in, 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 the, in the chat, um, the silence and the omission of discourses around history, museology, anthropology, and so on, that this is another type of violence. So I, I'm, I thank you all for your comments on this, because I think it's something that uh, people who uh, were hearing about the protests and, and the movement last year didn't quite get because unfortunately our, our museums are not helping to tell this history. So I wondered if we, we can move on to the next question, which is, I think, intimately related. And it's about this term decolonization, which has been gathering pace. Uh, you know, it, it, it's on everybody's lips now, you know, decolonizing collections, curriculums, and all sorts of things. And I, I just want to, in terms of what we've just said about colonialism and the history of um, museums, is it possible to decolonize a Western museum? Does anybody want to jump onto that first? Is it a contradiction to talk about this? Who wants to, Hassan's got his, yeah, go for it, Hassan. Yes, thanks. I've been thinking about this one uh, 
for, for quite a number of years, actually. Uh, I'm not sure about, I'm not, I'm not an academic, so I, I'm not sure about uh, what these terms actually mean now. Uh, I think uh, it's interesting, museums were in crisis, I think, in a kind of identity crisis of their, of their own uh, and have been for quite some time. And I think somehow, sometime, somehow, this is this does. Uh, there is a connection between us in the UK and the US, in that both countries were preeminently imperial powers, Britain first, and then uh, uh, the uh, USA more in the twentieth century. But where we both live in societies uh, which are um, undergoing fundamental. Um, uh, economic and social uh, and political uh, fallout. You know, the UK is not a, a a large voice on the world. I know the Tory government thinks that the UK post Brexit is still an important country, and they can project in some sense that the sense of empire. Uh, they can harness the sense of empire and nostalgia for empire within the population, and that's why they're fighting so hard. I think to stop museums here taking down statues, uh, handing stolen property back to the people that it belongs to and so on and so forth. Because I think the logic of our conversation today is to expose Britain as being a rather small, insignificant uh, country off the west coast of Europe. And there's a similar crisis, I think, happening in the USA in terms of its place in the world. And how, if you like, the, the, the forces at, at play are responding to, that, to, to those crises. So, I think when it comes to can museums decolonize, I think the museums community wants to. Uh, uh, I think, uh, obviously, I think it's a spectrum as to what people think that that would be. For some people, I think it would be taking museums down brick by brick and reading uh, and building back up again and filling them with new uh, with a new purpose. For others, it's probably to, to start by handing stolen goods back to the people they belong to and some kind of restitution and there's a kind of spectrum in between I guess um, but I, I do believe that the uh, that uh, that mu I think that people in the museum, museum sector understand that this is the way forward uh, that there is no other way forward in one sense uh, but there are very powerful forces arranged against the sector at the moment to try and stop any notion, any any progress along that kind of spectrum, whatsoever, whatsoever at all. Because, I, like I say, I think there 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 are national narratives at stake as to how important we are as societies or as a nation, um, which uh, I think the people uh, who who run our particular countries don't really want to see unravelled for the reasons which, uh, which I say. But um, just to end, just to end on. What I, uh, when I, I look at the USA in terms of the re reaction in the kind of cultural and and uh, and heritage sector to to the Black Lives Matter movement, I see a kind of insurgency uh, that there are other players, um, which, um, if you like, uh, activists within the sector are, are kind of drawing on, who have a lot of energy and uh, are maybe thinking things. Uh, which if you're kind of inside an institution, it's difficult to, to, to argue. Uh, and, I, I don't, uh, and I think that insurgency, that the people outside of the sector saying, you've got to push things forward faster in a more radical way. Um, uh, that's kind of where the conversation should be uh, had. I think it's a waste of time really for the music sector to have a conversation with, uh, with the Tory government over here. Uh, I think you just have to do what you feel is right. But, who do you draw on to actually push things forward? Uh, I think in the USA, I may be wrong, I, I want to know more. There seems to me groups of people who are reimagining uh, museums, who are not in the sector, but feel that they have some important role to play, uh, who are reimagining. And I think in, in the UK, we need, to, we need to find that constituency if we're gonna get past this impasse of the museum sector facing off against uh, powerful, um, uh, 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 the government and another powerful uh, individuals in society. So I think I, I, I think it is possible giving, uh, uh, but uh, you're, there's a crossroads I think we're at 
And the question is, how do we go forward? Thank you so much. Now, before I, I'm going to, I want Monica to, to jump in, because I want to hear how this plays in, in the United States, whether this term is really being used um, uh, in, with such liberality as it is here. But before you do that, I just wanted to remind people, because I, I uh, last summer was uh, quite uh, animated by this question. I found myself reading Franz Fanon in order to answer the question. Uh, the dying colonialism and, and, and so on. And he makes it quite clear that decolonization is about a power shift between an occupying force and, a, you know, it, it, there's a sense of, a sense of territory, uh, ownership of that territory and who runs that territory. Now, I just wanted to put that out there as, uh, uh, because I'm wondering whether a type of revisionism is happening in the use of this term. Can we decolonize the museum in that sense. Monica, what, what do you think? Well, I think there's many ways to define a term. And certainly for this modern moment, I have a definition that I'd like to share, a, a, a compilation of a definition. So I feel like decolonizing, while it may include repatriation or it may include fighting against oppressive power structures, it's really about the resilience and the resistance of nothing about us without us. And so as that relates to Black people and people of color and Black folks across the diaspora, it's kind of questioning the conventional wisdom, questioning the authority of who speaks for whom and who has power and who should. It's about reforming these harmful status quos and unlearning the colonist framework of dominance and denigration and plunder. And then really activating these radical new ways of knowing and respecting each other while speaking truth to power that those that were and are in power are redistributing resources, are repatriating, are restoring abundance, merit, favor, and making sure that privilege is distributed and shared and that equity is baked in and not just tossed on like croutons, right? So all of these are part of the decolonization framework that I reference and others that I know in the US do. And right now the term decolonization is trendy, it's sexy. Everyone wants to say they're doing it. A lot of the clients that I work with and organizations that I work for are about the work of diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism and decolonization. And I'm glad that terms are being used and bandied about in some ways, but in other ways, I think that we need to really think critically about what does it look like, full freedom from oppression, and then ultimately for folks of color and black folks to stop looking for a seat at the table and hoping someone will notice us and treat us well, hoping for redress in this violent white oppressive space of the museum sector in the UK and the US, we have to build our own tables. We have to strive to remedy and heal those organizations worth saving, but ultimately how can we create and reimagine community-centered socially responsive museums? So the Western Museum, is it possible to decolonize it? Maybe. Is it worth it? Maybe, but how can we birth new frameworks, new spaces, new museum? And I have to shout out some black centered spaces that are doing that work. The Black British Museum over in the UK, Sandra Shakespeare and those folks doing that work. The Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art in Brooklyn, the Anacostia Community Museum in DC with the Smithsonian. These are the upstart Black-based, Black-centered museums. And certainly there's many more that I have not even mentioned that are doing that work, but decolonizing to me looks like birthing new spaces of difference and resistance. Thank you. And in and, and, and what your final words there, Monica, I've got to hand over to Arike because you are you have such a space and and perhaps in Fanon's definition of what it means to decolonize rather than trying to refashion a kind of imperial institution, BCA is, an, if I may use this term, a kind of autonomous space. How do you regard the decolonization? Yeah, so BCA, one of its biggest superpowers is being independent so we're an independent charity we don't we're not nationally funded we're not funded by dcms um we do receive you know we have grant funding basically from various places but we are an independent charity and the initial creation of bca is absolutely 100 percent what monica is saying and all the way through what monica was saying i was like monica for prayers she's amazing um, but BCA's journey has been really difficult because, yeah, it's set out absolutely as a radical space formed by a collective of artists, parents, activists, educators, and 
no one took it seriously <laughs> until it started to take on some of the habits and actions of those institutions that are taken seriously. So BCA began with an object collection as well as archive collections. Um, and then it's grown into being predominantly an archive with a qualified archivist, which is all brilliant. But now some of the work that BCA is doing is almost to start to strip away some of those practices that we had to adopt in order to be taken seriously, in order to get funding, in order to get our incredible iconic building that we have at One Windrush Square, in order to, you know, be able to mobilize to look after those collections and just have a seat at that proverbial table which we would love to have a table of our own with the Black British Museum, with um, George Padmore Institute, for example, or the Institute of Race Relations. But this is, you know, this is the way the world is right now. And so some of the work we're doing now is absolutely about like questioning how archive catalogues are, do are done, questioning how interpretation is done, but questioning ourselves as much as as much as we're questioning what others are doing. Because now that we've got to a space where we have a loud enough voice and that people think of us as legitimate because we managed to take on enough of the behaviors and qualifications and strictures of the, the kind of parent institutional culture, now we're actually able to, to make those moves and become influential in our own right to start bringing down some of those patriarchal ways of working and thinking that actually don't service culture or heritage more generally. And I, you know, for the UK context, that's BCA's position, but Monica, obviously you're at the Smithsonian, so you are able to, within that Smithsonian architecture, have such a loud voice for Amer African-American and American culture. And for BCA, it's been a case of like 40 years of constantly, you know, being denigrated and being called ephemeral and being told that the collections are worth nothing um, to get us to a place where we're like, oh, OK, now people are taking us seriously. That's really interesting. Now we will use our voice for change. We've always been radical, but now we can actually activate what, what it is that we do. Thank you so much. So I'm wondering if there's a, is there a different tactical and strategic aim if you're working inside a one of these, as it were, um, imperial institutions, and if you're running an autonomous space such as uh, Arika is, is running, are, are we opening up a difference here? Um, 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 uh, I'm wondering, uh, Ian, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you working at the Art Institute of um, Chicago, is there a whole a different agenda for decolonization in that space as opposed to what Arike has um, and her organization has achieved? Great question. I think for me, I recognize that the process and history of colonization is complex multi-layered, generational, <laughs> um, and, and relentless, and that a process of decolonization is going to take just as complex, just as multi-layered, and just as relentless of a strategy. And so I think that we need folks in community, to Monica's point, birthing new frameworks, new institutions, new models, new ways of being. Uh, but we also need <laughs> uh, secret agents, you know, on the inside doing transformation work. And for me, in my role at the Art Institute of Chicago as executive director, inclusion and belonging, with the acknowledgement that my focus is really on the staff experience, our rationale with this is about transforming from the inside. We can only be as good of an institution as our people are. And, and so to shift and to focus on organizational health, to think about equity internally, the institution, the institutional processes and the infrastructure has been our strategy and our rationale. Um, and I, I know that we can meet organizers like Monica and, and the organizations that 
she's working with um, somewhere in the middle. And so for me, um, that, that I think that we need it all. Uh, and I don't want to <laughs> split hairs, but, but I also, I don't know if, I don't know, this is hard for me to say. I, I, I don't know 100% if it's possible yet. You know, I think it's more possible now than it's ever been. And it's increasingly more possible. Um, but I, I, I'm still looking to, to see it in terms of a, a Western museum engage and, and successively engage a decolonization process. And, and the last thing I, I wanna say is uh, for me, especially in the context of the US and the States, we've got to recenter indigenous and native voices in a conversation around decolonization. Uh, from from leadership <laughs> all the way through, you know, community impact. And um, I know that our institution's got a lot of work to do with that, uh, as well as many other institutions. It, it does mean engaging conversations around repatriation. It means thinking about our space differently, right? Uh, notions of decolonizations have connections to space and land. And so uh, we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of learning to do. But there are some really great examples. I think in this last year, I've been really, really impressed in thinking about what we can learn from libraries, for example, and uh, the work that I feel like libraries have done to decolonize their institutions. You know, I can go into a library and be next to a fourth grader, you know, working on their science project and a PhD scholar and someone who's just here to use the computer to print. And, and the amount of access is, is shared and equal. And so to those points about birthing new models and new frameworks, uh, that, that's the decolonization uh, bit that I wanna get to. Thank you so much, um, Ian. Um, Rachel, did you want to chip into that at all? Um, yeah, so um, this question of, you know, is it possible to decolonize a Western museum is something that, um, that in the decolonial guidance working group, we actually asked ourselves and we didn't really get to, no one came to the same answer. And that's partly because there is, there's a different vision of decolonizing for everyone. And we live in a really colonialized world still, mentally, physically, the structures. And so an imagined decolonial space will be different because it's completely reimagining our future. Um, but also there's questions of, you know, where do you put your energy? Is it in these spaces? Is it in your care, your um, taking care of others? Um, because decolonizing, decolonizing is, is structural, has to be holistic. Um, you, can't, you can't decolonize a museum without decolonizing education because there's so much that we have to unlearn and there's so much we have to learn whilst we're doing this work. So we're inevitably going to keep making mistakes. Um, so it has to be about thinking about the systems, thinking about the structures, but acknowledging that these systems and structures are kind of upheld by individuals. So trying to, yes, work towards systematically undoing the repressive and, and uh, marginalization that, um, that colonialism has left as a legacy that we experience, but it's also to think about ourselves, to think about where we are on the journey, where do we sit in the structure, how do we perpetuate the colonial inequalities, what don't we know, what are we happy to not know, um, how do we take care of ourselves and others, because there's so many people who've been doing amazing work on decolonizing for years, um, from you know actual political decolonizing, which still goes on. There you know, are many kind of instances where political decolonizing is still a reality that needs to be achieved. Um, but there is also the kind of decolonizing your mind um, that we're all struggling with. And so, you know, a lot of people have done this for a lot of, of years in a system that doesn't value them. And so there is you know burnout and real pain and a real internalized trauma and intergenerational trauma that we kind of build upon. And so I'm very interested in a form of decolonizing that it acknowledges that this is about power and structure and it is about kind of France Fanon and um, those kinds of ideas of kind of reclaiming space and kind of inverting the, the power structures or leveling it out um, as you know, Ian says, you know, about equality of access and, and that's those sorts of spaces where, you know, everyone's kind of able to reach the same things without barriers in place, which is, you know, the journey of the inclusion um, discipline. 
Um, but also that there, that decolonizing is about um, self care, radical self care, care for others, communities, valuing women's roles, like typically in in society, which is much more about kind of the bringing people together and and I don't mean to you know kind of subscribe to this you know male female idea, but it, you know I think that there's also a part of decolonizing that's very much about the patriarchy that also ignores what has been traditionally a woman's role in that idea of taking care of everyone as a way of surviving and as a way of remembering and connecting, you know, through the domesticity of cooking together or doing each other's hair, other other forms of memory that museum spaces don't really platform. So I think it's possible, but I think it's it's a different vision for different people. And that it kind of has to start as individuals who look at the structure. I don't like aiming for decolonizing the museum because I don't want it to feel like it's an end. I want it to feel like it's a constant journey. So yeah, those are my feelings. Thanks, Rachel. Now I'm gonna to jump to the last question because we've got four minutes before we open up to the audience. And I really wanna give a chance for people to put some other questions to us. So um, how should we, how do we, how should we think of the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on museums and arts and heritage? Has it produced change, real change? And perhaps can we keep this going? We've got about 30 seconds each to, to do this. <laughs> Sorry, anybody who wants to start, I'm, I'm not in I, any particular yeah, order. Yeah, I, I, could, I could start and just do like a quick, very quick sort of thought about it. Because um, Errol, when you when you proposed the questions to us in advance, that like, like, you know you had such as a, a statement such as the museum stands in solidarity with the black community throughout the world. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I'm like. Okay, so what do you mean by standing in solidarity? Because that feels like the appropriation of an activist slogan um, of a, or a civil rights slogan. What do you mean about black community? What do you mean about black community throughout the world? Um, if, yeah, so the, that's, my, that's my really quick one. It's like, okay, fine, but that statement needs a lot of unpicking. And to be honest, like in most, major museums meaning big ones you know not museums that are the small independent museums that have like five members of staff or less talk about like the big ones have hundreds of members of staff most of the black people at those museums are in the precarious jobs that were made redundant during the pandemic so you know that first of all you could start to stand in solidarity with with your staff Right? If you're going to stand in solidarity with black communities around the world. Um, so that was just a super quick. Obviously, there's lots that could be said around that. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Who wants to just finish off this, this uh, question? Monica. Yeah. I'm happy to yeah. pop in. Um, so I feel that the Black Lives Matter movement, um, to its credit, has revolutionized everything in our society, and rightfully so. Um, I think it is brilliant how decentralized the movement is. And certainly mm. I'm not just referencing mm. the Black Lives Matter organization, but mm. the many organizations, groups, collectives that advocate in defense of Black lives. So knowing that there is Black Lives Matter, the official chapters, and then there's many other activist groups and groups and collectives that pop up every day. They don't even have a name, but certainly have um, an agenda and a way forward. I want to surface that the Black Lives Matter organization and others have a statement, or I shouldn't say a statement, excuse me, 13 values that uphold the movement. Um, and certainly for those that want to research more, you can Google that. But of some of those values, I think these values can guide our way forward in having lasting change. Some of them are things we all know the terms of like empathy, diversity, intergenerational. Some of these values are about globalism and co collective value and loving engagement. But overall, it's about the dignity of the living and how to humanize and mitigate the impacts of those who have been killed brutally and how that doesn't happen again, even though it keeps happening again. And so to the question, I feel that there is so much value in what has happened. The energy has generated a lot of critical thinking, a lot of self-reflection and introspection, both for 
people, for institutions, for municipalities, for all form of civic infrastructure, and the need that we constantly iterate and change and improve upon ourselves and our processes in our society is an enduring one. Um, and I think that impact will last. Thank you, Monica. Um, Hassan, I know you, you uh, look as if you want to say something to, you want to close this, uh, we've, Yes, yeah. I, think, um, I, I think Rico makes a, a, a brilliant point, which you mustn't forget, is that we had an opportunity during the pandemic to actually move forward the agenda of Black Lives Matter uh, in terms of what, what would be the shape of the museums and the arts and cultural sector coming out. And, uh, and as Rico said, you know, you had the Black Lives Matter uh, statements from all the big national museums who were, who were at, simultaneously engaged in drawing up plans to, to lay off or sack most of their black staff. Um, the contradiction is so stark as to, as, to be, as, as to be ridiculous. I believe that most of them, the, the national museums um, put out Black Lives Matter uh, statements because they wanted to shield themselves from um, from a more rigorous uh, a criticism of of their practices and uh, the positions that they hold, uh, I I I was I was um, uh, but I think this is rebanded on them because actually if you look at the opinion polls and I think this is very important is those who want to move the agenda forward are actually in the majority and have majority support in Britain. Uh, you know if you look at all the polls uh, that. Uh, particularly around the uh, statues and things like that. Um, the, they, they show that actually the majority of people polled actually think that these statues should come down, that Black Lives Matter is important and so on and so forth. But somehow I think uh, we've been maneuvered into a position where we think that we're on the defensive and that we're the minority uh, and therefore we're, we're kind of afraid of, of having these arguments. But, but I, I think it's mo it was mostly, to be honest, a cynical move, these Black Lives Matter statements, but I do, uh, my, my question is, is who's going to hold them to account for putting out those statements and then going in the opposite direction? Well, I'm hoping that this is what we're doing now in a way and, and that we can continue to do so. So thank you all so much for your thoughtful responses to those questions. And I, I'm going to open up to the audience now. And um, I'm, I'm relying on colleagues at the Museum Association to feed me some questions that I'll put to you from the audience. So. You need to come back and do this, Errol, I can... Y yes, please, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> That's yeah. absolutely fine. Um, yeah. So there's three questions, but do put more in um, as you go. So there's uh, uh, the first one from Rowan Brown um, asking about a um, uh, EJI Brian Stevenson's theory that for society to heal, we need to treat the transatlantic slave trade with the same distinct and sensitive handling as has afforded the Holocaust, and particularly learn from Germany's civil response. Um, and I would like to know how the panel feel, uh, whether the panel feel there's any mileage in this approach, if anyone wants to start. I'll start. Um, just that I have a, a general reaction to the, that com com comparison to dealing with the Holocaust and, and slavery and colonialism in that the German context is held quite highly within this kind of narrative that talks about how they dealt how they have dealt with the narrative of the Holocaust, but they're dealing with the narrative of their colonial history is just as problematic. And there is a question of, um, these are different contexts, but this but genocide has occurred many times around the world and we don't talk about all of them. We do talk about the Holocaust. There is a um, irreverence around the First and Second World War. That means it's a really recognizable narrative and it's the universal narrative, you know, there's a, the, the way that the story has been told across contexts is that it is, it is clear there was a right and there was a wrong and we know and we can, we can deal with this quite clearly. There's legislation in place to deal with, um, to deal with uh, Jewish objects that were seized by Nazi Germany and that can be restituted and they've, we've got legislation in place. So definitely there are lots of lessons that we can learn about how it's being dealt with. But I think that there is also something very important to note about the fact that, that in that context, this erasure still occurs within this kind of narrative of colonialism um, and the relationship to um, enslaved, um, trading with enslaved people and devaluing black lives. So there, it's more complicated than a direct comparison, but I think there are, are, are elements you can learn from from the, the kind of structures that they've put in place to deal with this history. 
I would have to um, look up more about Germany's civic response because I'm not as aware of that. Um, but I do generally agree with the sentiment. I think that the transatlantic slave trade and all its you know, deleterious effects has been, it's been captured in fits and spurts, but not as holistically as possible. I am excited about the work that I believe it's the Museum of Slavery in Liverpool is doing to tackle some of that. I know the one in Charleston, the International African American Museum is gonna have some ties around the transatlantic slave trade, but I think certainly just the topic needs to be more sensitively handled. And then bringing that to this current moment, do we have a day of memory or you know, give people time to, to process feelings? How can we, operationalize the empathy around that so that it isn't just like, yeah, this happened in history, but the same kind of gravitas that speaking about the Holocaust has, speaking about enslavement would have the same kind of emotional respect and, I don't know, just honor and mindfulness. So I, I would agree with that. May I answer as well, do you mind? Um, so there are a couple of UNESCO International Days of Remembrance for the transatlantic slave trade. One of them is in March, one of them's in August. And BCA, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we are reaching our ambition as national, but we are based in London, so we work a lot with the Mayor of London. Um, and BCA has been working with the Mayor of London and Arthur Torrington of the Equiana Society um, and Sankofa Day. Um, which is slavery remembrance, to, to plan what happens on August 23rd, which is one of the UNESCO days for remembrance. Um, and it, it is kind of striking, you know, even with a, with a mayor who, who is committed to celebrating the day, it is kind of striking how difficult it actually is to get that day into his, into his diary and to, to amass you know, support around celebrating, well, it's not celebrating, but commemorating that day and having that day as a day of remembrance and galvanizing support around it. So while National Museums Liverpool, where the International Slavery Museum is, um, they do work. I know museums in Bristol do work, the Greenwich Maritime Museum commemorates that day and the Museum of London commemorates that day. It is actually fairly difficult to galvanize like a civic response to that day. And so I completely recognize why these comparisons to how the Holocaust Memorial Day is recognized by civic authorities and not only by individual cultural organizations. That's that's actually very frustrating to see the dis the, the, the difficulty in getting traction. And um, it's not really helpful to compare the two because it's comparing pain with pain is is problematic in and of itself um but certainly that you know unesco have recognized two days it shouldn't be so difficult to get our civic leaders to also recognize at least one of those days mm. in a way that has a, a solemn commemoration that all that our, our heritage bodies can contribute to and get behind and generate conversation and education around. Mm. Uh, if, if, I, if I may um, comment on that actually as well, because I just wanted to emphasize something that Rachel said about right and wrong. And um, what I find really disturbing about um, the attitude to um, black history is uh, I think it's highlighted by a comment that was made by a professor at the LSE uh, who I think was sacked as a result, David Starkey. He said something like, um, the slave trade and couldn't have been that bad because look how many Africans are walking about. And what he said, okay, it's one guy that said this, but for me, it lit, a sort of, it lit up something about how, universal is the idea that the the slave trade was wrong you know just to use Rachel's dichotomy right and wrong you know and that how much work still needs to be done to get that recognition before we could have um uh, the kind of um recognition that the the, the the question is implying you know um yes I just want to give one little piece of factoid that I remind myself it will be the year 2111, in the context of Black people, were in America, where Black people will have been free longer than they were enslaved. 2111. 
2111. So yeah, we've got a ton, a ton of work to do. I think that this has been such a huge call to action. I don't know of any other example of protest or civil action as large as this outside of global war. Um, and so the question is, how are we going to respond? Um, and I think that a lot of the energy has cooled off since this time last summer. Um, but the you know accountability has to be maintained. And I think it, it can't just be the people impacted by these systems and ideologies. It's gotta be the allies and co-conspirators as well. Um, so yeah. Should I read another one? There's one that was in shared in chat earlier that um, comes up quite often about how museums can decolonize at a local level, um, and particularly to kind of taking the perspective of a, a rural independent museum. Um, if anyone's got any, I don't know, insight or practical advice, you could have on that. Rachel's got a hand up. Do you want to go for it? Sorry, I've got my question box open, so sorry, missed anyone else. That's all right. Um, just quickly, yeah, it's one of the things that we're considering with um, the guidance again, because we want to make this something that is applicable in multiple contexts. And primarily it's about understanding that decolonizing, regardless of whether or not you have an anthological collection or your collection can be directly linked to colonialism and loot, and that idea of theft and, and those kind of very visceral ideas that the decolonial word brings to mind, that means a lot of people step back and say, this isn't my fight this isn't my problem my collection is just you know about a local you know history or a, a club or is to understand and reflect on how what decolonizing means and what it is actually looking to do beyond just that direct kind of um, repatriation narrative and it's actually about the kind of changing the narrative the, the decentering and de stabilizing this idea of what is neutral and normal and so what, what, that everything else is other or strange and that um, these ideas have kind of teeth that hurt people and kind of take that time to reflect on how is it appropriate to your context because it is to take that as a starting point it is it is appropriate to your context it is relevant to a small local museum um, and to kind of work out um, kind of the individuals in place what kind of, what can you do from your context and how can that be scaled up and scaled down? Scaled down to an individual. We know some organizations are almost entirely volunteer run. Some are entirely volunteer run. So, you know, the, the idea is that this, this requires a lot of, of resources. It doesn't, you can think about it from your own practice, the books you read, the ways that you impact and talk to your visitors, the, um, the, um, the stories you want to tell, the kind of conversations you allow yourself to be a part of or you step out of or you sidestep. So that would be my advice. And that's sort of the advice that's coming through um, um, from the working group. I'd like to piggyback on that too. Um, I think, you know, while this might not be direct decolonization, just being an equitable organization is steps in that right direction. And so if we think about how can organizations seed power, how can they share agency or as a foster agency and share authority with their audiences? What does it look like to give um, their platform and signal boost what's happening in community. And so a lot of times when I advise museums and they're like, oh, we're fine, no one said anything bad about us, we're not racist, we're good people. And I'm like, okay, how's your succession planning going? What person of color or difference or dis disabled or otherly abled or different gender identity or expression person are you training to replace you? How are you looking at your supplier and vendor chain in terms of who are the organizations that you spend money with what does it look like for your staff to be getting more, better benefits, pay? All of these are things internally that museums can do to be more equitable, to work toward decolonization, as well as joining the fight to use their public platform in service of decolonization efforts. So I think those are always things that we can be on a continuum of improvement for as museum stewards. Anyone else wants to, to, to say anything, just, just jump in, by the way. But then it sort of relates to another question, um, sort of Monica's point from um, Leslie um, um, in, in the Q&A, which is, is class barrier the main obstacle preventing genuine diversity in our museums? Um, if anyone wants to, re to respond to that question. 
I wouldn't have thought so. No. Thank you. It's an ingredient, though, isn't it? That's linked to other things. I mean, I think that's the way to, um, you know, that class sustains certain positions on race, on on gender. You know, it's the interlinking of these uh, hierarchies that that gives them their respective power. I, I would have thought. I think I think we do have to contextualize uh, race and class together. I I think that's very important. Uh, it's interesting to me that most of the people who are arguing uh, from the government side and, and, and their allies uh, about not taking statues down and and uh, I, I was looking them all up, but they nearly all went to public propriety schools. They all went to Eton. They all went to Cambridge or Oxford. This is a, this is a class of people who see their uh, who clearly see uh, their interests being threatened by this whole debate. So I mean that's interesting. But also, I, I was also looking at the uh, at the origins of some of the uh, the people in uh, like um, Coulson in Bristol, uh, the um, Robert Jeffrey in in Hackney, Hans Sloan uh, at the Tate, and uh, yes, they were all involved and profited from the slave trade, which is reason enough for those statues to come down. But if you but they were all these statues are erected at the end of the nineteenth century actually after the abolition of slavery. So what was the purpose of these statues? And who were these men after they came back at the end of the abolition of slavery? These, these, these statues really were erected at the end of the 19th century to terrorize the urban poor here in the, in, in the UK. That's what they're about. All the, the, these, these men were involved in different ways of repressing, if you like, the, the early working class or the working class population of, of the UK at the time. It wasn't just that they, their, um, their violence and terror ended when slavery ended. Uh, they had a whole other careers, basically um, setting up um, uh, arms houses, which were kind of, uh, which were then incorporated in the workhouse system. Uh, uh, Colston was a man who ruled Bristol <laughs> after the abolition of slavery. He thought it is his right to do, right to do that. Hans Sloan, interestingly enough, he married into a Sloaning family. Uh, but where did he get his original money from? The plantation of Ulster. In other words, dispossessing the Irish um, from, their, uh, from their land in, in Ireland, the oldest British, British colony. So I think, you know, there, as well as, for me, that when we tell, we, when we, we get a chance to retell this story, uh, I think we, um, uh, we also we we, we kind of need to tell a kind of total history uh, about these people and how they uh, uh, and how they relate uh, how they relate to questions of not only oppression but exploitation as well. I'm going to say something really quick. I f I really want to understand what is genuine diversity. I don't think I've seen genuine diversity yet anywhere except maybe in the park and on the street grocery store. There's a three. So I don't think that genuine diversity has been achieved yet. Genuine diversity will be when the makeup of folks on this panel, the different identities and intersections and race and class and expressions would be on a panel about something innocuous like registrars and collections, right? When it isn't just talking about oppression and injustice and black lives, when there can be a panel free from those discussions that still has a diverse mix of people. So genuine diversity, super high dream, utopian, super hard to achieve, but it's gonna to have to come not from box checking and tokenized performance optics. We have two Latinx and four Indian and black and okay, now we have our mix and let's put that during ethnic heritage month and we're good, right? That's not it. Genuine diversity, I think, really looks at fully integrating seamlessly to the best that we can, different facets of society, socioeconomic, intergenerational, different kinds of cognitions. And then thinking about how do we take what we usually would assume those people could do, turn it on its ear and make sure that everyone has access to everything. So I really wanna think about genuine in the context of broader than this space. And I, if, can I build upon that? Because I think the two are very much connected, this idea and the dream of genuine diversity and the understanding and internalizing that these are intersectional ideas. Race and class are not oppositional. They are really important to be considered together, as is gender, as is sexuality, as is um, disability. Um, 
there are lots of different marginalizations. And if we silo them to kind of say like, this is a race issue, this is a class issue and, and you know, not kind of see these interwoven narratives, these complex histories of, of oppression, of survival, of um, kind of hope and love and growth and, and mixing because very few families, because that's where I see a lot of intersect um, real kind of diversity. I, I come from the Caribbean, so a Caribbean family can be a very diverse group of people, but you very rarely are these identities, things you own on, in your own, you know? You, you, I am who I am in my body and it's all of its intersections, all of the protective characteristics within it. And it's not just my, I can never sing, single out my, my gender from my race or from my um, sexuality or from my, my disability. They're all kind of interwoven and the oppressions don't just, there aren't firm lines between them. So I think there's something about if we understand the, the kind of complexities and the, the combination of these identities and how marginalization functions in a way of creating this sort of narrow normal, normal that oppresses a lot of people in a lot of ways, we will be able to kind of strive towards real diversity because we will be thinking about the importance of a diverse perspective on everything, on lots of different, you know, questions, you know, about kind of spinach growth in the 21st century, as well as kind of racism. Thanks, everyone. You mentioned um, Salo's Rachel with regards to intersectionality, and there's a question from Anthony Kaloum um, in the Q&A that's, um, I'll quote it, uh, well, I'll read it out loud, it's short, so it's Black Power, Black Poppy, Black Lives Matter, all working in silos. How do museums um, unite these as a pan-Africanist anti-racist entity? Um, I don't know, if it, well, you may not agree with that sentiment first, place, but yeah, do you have any thoughts about kind of cohesion and, and working uh, in a collective way? I would say that I don't think it's museums role to organize the organizers, but I do think, again, museums can, in a spirit of an open hand, offer the assets that they have, right? The space, the resources, the kind of platform. So if those are four different organizing groups, activist groups, invite them all together to convene at your space or ask them one-on-one -on -one what they need and commit to them institutionally and sustainably over time, as opposed to trying to mesh them together and say, okay, you all are doing a black thing. Let's do it together for the benefit of us. So I think we have to really be careful about that and make sure that you're approaching them not transactionally, um, but intentionally and making sure the intention is to support that movement organically and see how you can bring the richness to the museum as opposed to just see them all as one, you know, unsiloed mass. I also think that one of the biggest violences of, of colonization is, is this idea of this erasure that we all know, but what a lot of these organizations do and a lot of initiatives have, um, have to live with is this idea that they're the first and like, it's always a rewritten, it's always like, like the first, um, there's always this first narrative. And often these kind of first people to do these things um, aren't actually the first, but they're the people before them haven't been recorded in the same way and they're kind of erased. And eventually a lot of these first people will find out maybe through archives that they weren't the first, but there were other people before them. The first narrative kind of gives people the sense that they are alone and quite lonely, that they don't see a path through, that they're not building upon a legacy, but also it encourages the siloed way of working. So that's just um, something that we could do is help to record the legacies that came before us so that we know that we're connected to each other or we're inspired by the same people. And maybe the way we enact our activism is different and the path and the vision we have isn't the same so we're not working together but we're aware that we're working within the same context and in the same legacy if, if i may comment though that the, it's interesting the words one uses to describe these situations because i sort of come from a political background where words like autonomy were used to describe specific struggles over specific issues now i'm, I'm not sure whether silo you know what I mean? If, if we, that seems to be putting a different flavor on something which um, is seen as in, in some political um, situations as a necessary thing that you need to have autonomous movements over specific issues in order to advance particular um, causes, if you like. Yeah, there's, a, there's a question here um, that's, um, uh, super typical just talking about Palestine um, and um, obviously talking about the, uh, the kind of situation there um, um, 
and and the parallels with um uh, black liberation struggle so they don't use parallels to say in, in uh, the, the linked um, and asking how can museums oppose the system promoting apartheid via their institutions um I don't have any thoughts around that that issue and sort of global events at the moment. The big one to tackle, I know. Should we move on if no one wants to to to, to go with that one? Um, it's quite UK centric. Um, so apologies, um, Monica, you know, you may have used, but um, it's talking about the, the the Queen and the awards given by the Queen, which were very turned down, and obviously um, all about colonialism and empire. Um, and how uh, does the panel have a view on how to untangle this kind of patronage, um, which is often at the heart of museums? Another big one. So. <laughs> Any thoughts on, on royal patronage at this time? Um, not specifically on royal patronage, but I think that there is, um, there is often if for something that we believe in quite strongly and quite ideologically, sometimes we have really strong views that other people should believe and act in the same way that we that, that we do about certain things. Um, and I know with the, with royal patronage, what it does is it it provides platform and and kudos and power to people. And so some people choose to take the power um, to give them a, a a platform to leverage to make change and maybe to. This, this, um, this, this assemble the system from within them. You know, there's a, a lot of talk of how, how you need both the energy that's inside the system and outside the system to make change. And I don't know if the system should stay in place, but I think that there are many who take these roles to make change as insider activists. And there are many who refuse them to kind of make a point that the system is, is broken. I think both are valid approaches to kind of activism within, and I don't I pretend to know which one is most fruitful or, or, or most or going to make the most change because, um, but I, I, I personally try to respect different people taking the different, different routes through because this is a large systematic problem that we have to deal with. And um, sometimes you can use a platform to critique a platform and sometimes you can critique a platform by completely by using by being offered it and saying no, because a lot of us can turn down a, a, a something that isn't offered to us ever. Um, there's also the power in being selected by those systems of power to be recognized and then to say, I don't want you. So yeah, there's the, the power also comes from that, but I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, I mean I don't it doesn't really matter to me whether people turn down medals from the Queen or not. I'm a Republican, so maybe that's my, <laughs> you know what my opinion would be. But but isn't there more of a, uh, a an interesting question, which is the question of actually how um, uh, activists who enter institutions um, resist being incorporated or assimilated into those institutions? How, you know, uh, how can we get beyond, uh, how, how can we get beyond this politics of representation, which I think, uh, some in the sector, of, well, not just in, I mean, in society, the notion of what we must find is we must find a black person or a brown person, a person of colour for this and that job. Uh, we must get them. In, we must get them into institution. And time and time again, what we find is that these people uh, uh, often who are appointed uh, fall foul of the kind of dominant hegemonic uh, uh, power plays within museums. And 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 you know it, it can end it can end badly. Uh, how do we? How, what can we do? Well, it's a more interesting question for me. Is what can we do to make sure that uh, uh, activists who enter the kind of uh, the museum institutions uh, are are supported in that what they have to offer? They don't leave behind what they have to offer, but somehow what they really have to offer, which may be edgy and radical. Um, it is somehow protected because at the end of the day, these are the people who, who hopefully are going to change things. So I'm more interested in that kind of question. I think. Oh, do we have time for one more question or do you want to go to your, your final question? There's a, yeah, so there's a question in chat from Brenda, um, which is um, how important are the communities themselves in our desire to galvanize change and how can they ensure that their local museums are more deeds than words? 
They're so important, uh, critical. I mean, it's the backbone, it's the blood, it's the way forward. And, and for me, that is the sort of, uh, for me, working definition of, <laughs> uh, of equity. You know, similarly to decolonization for us, by us, how can you even know uh, that the impact that you're hoping to have is in alignment with your intention if you're not connected and embedded in community? It can't be transactional. It can't be organizations helicoptering in to say, this is the thing that we need or the cool thing that we'd like to do. Um, don't you want to be a part of that? Thank you so much. We may come back next year. No, we've got to be in deep relationship and in deep deep partnership with community and community leaders. And that's gonna look very different than most of the Western museums and Western culture institutions um, have been in relationship with community and community organizations. And I think that's a part of the new work and the new birthing that we'll have to do. We won't be able to do this work without communities. The leadership is necessary and we need their voices. Great. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for um, fielding those questions for us. That's really helpful. And thank you to the panel for such a rich discussion. Um, I, I really think this, this debate, um, yeah, is, is needed to happen. And we need to have more of it um, in different ways. And um, I just thank you so much for, for your thoughts on this. I think it's been a really, I'm glad that we've had this uh, US, UK um, perspective on this. I think it's enriched the, the, the discussion a lot. And um, we've got literally four, three minutes left. If there's anything you'd like to say in closing, I welcome you to, to do that now. If anybody wants to say a closing remark, what should we do next? Or any, anything that you didn't manage to say earlier? It's incumbent, I think, for us to be relevant and viable institutions or places or spaces of gathering in the future. We have to do this work or, 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 it'll, or it'll erode. Um, so that's the one thing I'd like to, to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, final words. Would you like to have the last word, Arike? Do you, do you have a, a closing? I always got something to say. It's not always helpful, <laughs> so I've been a bit quieter. Um, I think I am just really pleased that the museum's community across the UK and the US are working together. And I think that's incredibly important when we're in a time in the UK where you know national museums are having trustees reappointments blocked by the government because they support decolonial decolonial narratives or they've done research in these areas and so for me that the the, the very sinister um top-down approach to try and crush museums doing research into their own collections for example that could be construed as decolonial is 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 mapped it is countered by events like this and opportunities for people who are doing the work to be able to come together and offer support to each other. I think it's incredibly important that we are able to support each other and not to retreat into silos or to really, you know, become silent and have our voices quietened by uh, the intimidation that, that we might be receiving. Yes, I, I think that's very wise. Thank you. Thank you, Erika, because I think we know, all know what you're referring to. And um, I, I, I also want to, I think this working together with the Museums Association has been really um, good. And we're going to be continuing this uh, debate at the, at the conference. And yeah, um, I also want to thank so, the- Can I sorry? say one thing? Yes, one thing. yes, yes. Yeah, before, we, <laughs> okay. before we close. Um, yeah. I just want to say rest in power to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, yeah. Ahmaud Arbery, yeah. those who have been victims of racial violence in the UK, the US and abroad. I think that it's incumbent upon us to reflect on this past year of uprising and pandemic and what mm -hmm. has it taught you about mm -hmm. yourself and your privilege and how others live and breathe and grieve when humanity is denied. And we have to reflect on the promise, the progress and the continued challenges of social justice in museums. So I just want to 
recenter on why we've governed and why we've yeah. come today and yeah. remember those who are the victims. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your wise thoughts and also to the audience for the um, very stimulating questions. And again, to the Museums Association for hosting and um, co-producing this event with us. So thank you all and we're dead on time. 1930 so well that's that's british standard time i'm not sure what the time is in america <laughs> but thank you all again yeah thank you bye-bye <laughs> so we're closed now thank you <laughs>